Welcome to Atheist Talk. My name is Grant Steves and I am your host. The program this evening is going to be on art and the relationship of art to the world of science. And my guest is Lynn Fellman. She has a studio, the Fellman Studio in Minneapolis, and it's also a gallery. And you can see some of the art on display behind us. Lynn is an extraordinary artist and entrepreneur. It is a privilege to introduce her to our cable audience. Lynn has taken her artistic ability and integrated it with an understanding of science and DNA. And in this program, we will explore her artistic development. In this, and you may find out more about her by going to her studio or gallery or her website, which is www.fellmanstudio.com. Welcome, Lynn. Thanks, Grant. It's wonderful to be here. Well, it's, it's been a great, a real delight to have this opportunity to talk to you about art and your background in it, because this, to me, is an adventure story. And it will develop over a period of time this evening as we go through the programs. But I'd like to start out looking at your educational background and how you became the artist you are today. So where did you start out? Well, I grew up in Minnesota here and went to um, school in Edina and um, high school and grade school. Mm -hmm. And a really big influence, it was a good part of my education, was uh, my dad at home was a commercial artist and worked out of the home. And so I'd go downstairs to his studio, which had two drawing tables, and do my homework at the table opposite of him and got to know the tools, the basic tools of art production, um, which was called key lining from that era. So, so that um, you know, bit of influence and sort of mentoring at home was really important. Um, so you have a genetic base, <laughs> in a sense, and someone to be your mentor every day. Right, well, a predisposition. And there was a lot of conversation, as they say, how um, one of the fascinations about genetics today is epigenetics, which is the um, sort of the confluence of our genome along with our environment, and which is our culture. Right. And so that home culture really fostered creativity. My dad always said, it's, you're special when you're, when you're creative. It's wonder wonderful to be creative. So you, you, you finished your diploma degree at, at Edina High School, and then you went on to the University of Minnesota? That's right. And, and received a degree in the fall. That's right. And, and what influences did you have at the University of Minnesota? We'll give them a plug, too. Okay, well, it was a yeah, it was a study arts program, uh -huh. and uh, they, within that, you select an area that you emphasize, and of course I wanted to do drawing, but at the time that wasn't the major, so it was drawing and painting. Uh, but it was always my drawing that was a really big part of my imagery, and you always start with pencil with all of your concepting, and then I worked mm -hmm. with a lot of different, you know, crayons and colored pencils, and then, of course, did oil painting. Um, a big... Uh, piece of it too that I have really good memories about and remembered a lot from were um, the print teachers that we had okay. and you know it's just like sort of living in a candy store when you walk into these art classes <laughs> it's just all this really fun stuff and great materials and wonderful papers and there was um, one print teacher in particular who was good Zygmunt Preeti and the Walker Art Center has a lot of his work that they have uh, in storage and they show frequently um, at any rate, but he had a fascination with paper, and he ta talked a lot about that and um, the process. And so what I learned from that was a, a sense of materials, mm -hmm. but also um, knowing that uh, a good sense of, of quality and method and craft goes into formulating good art, good fine art. It's very okay. important. Well, I, I've, I've known some individuals that have graduated from the program, and they, they have produced some pretty good art that I've seen. So it, it, it is undoubtedly a fairly good school to develop artists. Now, in, in your beginning, of course, we're talking about art in its non-digital age, in, its non, in, in the age before all of this magic of cameras, and, and you had to deal with real materials. That's right. That's a very good point. And then it was later on that I got into the digital realm. I, um, after I graduated from college, I started my own business um, not too long after that. I worked um, 
at one of the biggest employers around, Target, but in the advertising department. Okay. But I left after a little while and started my own business right away. Uh, you know, my dad did that. It seemed normal to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it was illustration that I did, and it was still, like, like you said, it was still very traditional, mm -hmm. traditional materials. But then in 1987, the door really opened for me to do digital work, and that was the year, the summer, that Adobe Illustrator came out. Okay. And being, um, you know, really grounded in drawing, that's the program that attracted me. Okay. It's a vector program, and the reason why I'm talking about it is because the things you see up there is, is all vector art today. So I've been working for quite a while with the digital tools, okay. and was one of the first artists in Minneapolis to do that. Okay. Now, in, in order to come to this and bring all these things together, it seems to me that you'd have to develop a kind of an aesthetic, a philosophy of art, and you're influenced by certain artists. And though it may not show up in this specific piece of material that we have here, it still has some influence on you. And you, you, you've mentioned, for example, that Cezanne, Picasso, how did they influence your art? I've, I've always been curious about how the great artists influence the next great artist. Oh, that's a wonderful question. Well, early, t early 20th century art as a whole was, was, I think, very important for me for a number of reasons. It's, uh, when you look at that art, they're very much um, interested in early, interested in early materials. Mm -hmm. But most of it is form and line, and of course, someone like Matisse later with color. Mm -hmm. So, but each artist had its own emphasis. Picasso is, is, is a genius as a draftsman, and that's essentially his, I think, his impact. And so I always look to his, how he developed a lot of variety of imagery, and a lot of it is figurative. Mm -hmm. So my figurative work, which you'll see later, has some of that as an impact. Um, use of line was something he used. Then, uh, and then um, Cezanne is the big one for form mm -hmm. and the idea of um, you know, breaking up shapes, which of course then cubism was about that, and fracturing the plane of the image. Um, so then we're getting into conceptual art, which okay. followed on the heels a little bit later after surrealism, of course, is Duchamp. And Duchamp is still huge today with conceptual art. The idea that, uh, well, the fact that there, there is a concept in your images, you probably don't see it, but it, it's a very intellect kind of thing. Okay. Um, uh, then later, uh, expressionism, and my work, I think, has gotten a lot more expressionistic, loose, uh, a lot of use of the arm. Um, you know, uh, something that was said about uh, Pollock, that he painted it, his painting was an arena in which to act. And mm. so, you know, freeing you from that edge of the picture plane and moving about a little more freely, expressively. So, yes, those are all things that, you know, are sort of behind the scenes, that sort of sure. ground you in what you do. But you know something that's really fun is that everyday images that we see in print materials and on TV and, you know, the big influence with the Japanese culture, um, has in our graphic arts. Um, there's always things going on in the day that I'm looking at and sort of absorbing. The Japanese art, is, it, is that the anime kind yes, of yes. influence that you're, you're interested in? Because I, I know that mm -hmm. comes out in their, their I guess you, we, we would call them comic books, uh, that they have a lot of drawings and very expressive. Yes, well, and also, but they're very much um, grounded in like the, the essence, the, the very basic shapes of the sphere and the cone and the block and it's very, and it's very graphic too, a lot of flat color, um, and a lot of line work. A line is very important in that too. Okay, and that comes back to your influences here, that, that you, you, you have an influence in the area of, of this process of ideas that, that you, you create. Is it kind of a graphic art then? Well, it, that's, that's a very good question, and I, and I think a way to relate to you know, what you're asking there is, um, along with the fine art that you're seeing here, which is really my personal statement, mm -hmm. um, all of the digital t things that we're talking about, 1987, those, that was my business work that I would, was doing, which was commercial work. And so my clients, and I still have these clients today, are East Coast and West Coast, but it's an application um, for illustration and, and corporate communication. Okay. So that has a little different focus with use of color and use of line and use of subject matter, of course. Okay. When, when I first went to your studio and I was noticing some paintings up on the wall, are those early paintings? Were those your paintings? Well, if, you're, if you look at the cityscapes that I yes, did, those. that was uh, for a show with a specific focus. Okay. And it's something I always wanted to do. I wanted to do scenes in Minneapolis. And the style that I had was um, sort of a bird's eye view and things mm -hmm. were distorted. And mm -hmm. it's very sort of light and 
fanciful feeling and real joyful. You use a lot of really what I think are vibrant colors that, that I noticed. Uh, and, and I don't want to use the word pastel because that, well, I just did. But, <laughs> but it, it isn't really a pastel, but it is a lighter shade, a, a tone. That's a, that's a very good way to talk about it. Uh, a key, co key component that I use in my vector drawing program are these graduated fills, where you go from a, a very dark, saturated color into a lighter shade. And that gives, um, it gives a rendered feel as well. So you're seeing a lot of that. Okay. And a big part of the vibrancy that comes from color that I use is when you, you do two things. You juxtapose them with your complementary colors. Mm -hmm. And I can point, out, point that to you right here on this scarf, okay. where I'm using um, orange next to blue, a complementary color, yes. and yellow close to the, to the purple, right? Mm -hmm. Not next to it, mm -hmm. but close to it. So that gives you a little tension and a vibrancy. And the, and the pictures that you were talking about, they're not here, but I used a lot of real saturated colors next right. to white. And mm -hmm. that made the color breathe and have a real life to it. Right. Because it, it was in the evening when I was at, at the studio, and they were almost, and I, I, I don't remember if there, were, there was a light focused on them necessarily, but they seemed to be very luminous. Ah, wonderful. In, in quality. And I, I, I mentioned in an, at the time that I thought they looked like something from Toulouse-Lautrec, because I, I'm not an artist and I don't have the, the history of art, but there was something about, I remember seeing... Um, a scene where he was out on the street in a little bistro, and but his were always really dark. Uh huh. And I thought this this is to me like Toulouse Lautrec only really bright and sh very uh, alive, uh -huh. full of life. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, you know, one thing to think about though is he was he probably had a lot pure, purer color and things have gotten dark, but we won't know That's, that for sure. That, that over time, yeah. <laughs> sure. Some of the things you were seeing too in my work is that I do all my own printing. I have a real large format printer, and uh, everything that's on paper is 100% rag paper. Okay. And the way that ink goes down is a brand new uh, method. Okay. It's only been around about five years, and, and the ink sits up on that surface. Mm. And I'm working with a lot of transparencies and layering okay. too, so you're getting some depth, a depth of color. But it's okay. a real different kind of method, and it does have a different look to it. Okay. So you, you've made a transition, in a sense, in, in developing your art, because you've moved from the, the palette and the, 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 the uh, 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 looking at it in terms of the traditional art palette to things which are much more printed out. Rather than painted on, you're printing them out. And there's, there's a process, I would assume, in doing that. And we, you've mentioned it in terms of the, of, of the latest techniques, five years. But when I look at this, I think of mass production and just rolling out material. This is a very detailed, sophisticated kind of design. And in the past, a graphic art would be, we could have a, a block. You just sort of stamp it. I know this isn't stamped. So could you explain in some way how this magic occurs? Because this is quite beautiful, I think. Oh, great. I'd like to. Well, um, these scarves start out, um, as the material starts out, as, as white, 100% silk. And I get this out of Nevada. And it's specially formulated on the surface to take the inks that I have. So it's a special ink set. It's very expensive, as well as the fabric, because sure. it's all new technology. And then I buy the backing, which is 100% China silk out of New York. Um, but back to the front part that I actually print on. So this is printed by me on my printer in my studio. And it's a large roll of white fabric that um, has a paper backing adhered to it. So it goes through that, pre that, that printer very nicely. And it keeps it nice and taut. So when it comes off the printer, I lay it out, I let it dry for a bit, and then I can peel off that paper, and I get this nice, beautiful, lightweight silk. It has wonderful draping. Okay. Um, these are a couple of different kinds of silk. Um, uh, they have a different kind of twist to them, and when you feel them, one is a little rougher, one's a little softer. Mm -hmm. This one has a little different see. color backing, but I love these saturated colors yes. on the back. Now, when, when, when you talk about the finishing the product, is do you do the seam work? Because this is, a, as you pointed out, there are two pieces of silk here. That's a really, yeah. Do you do all the seam work and all that busy work, that 
difficult stuff too? <laughs> well, I didn't want to get into sewing at all. I wanted to just stay the creative part and, and the quality control sure. and the printing. So I, I have people that sew for so, me. Okay. And so when I send that, sometimes I keep the paper on the back so it doesn't ravel too much mm -hmm. and, and pack it up and send it off to them. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, I have people sew for me. Okay. <laughs> but now I want to get to the design itself because you, you develop a concept. And we're, we're moving toward the, the real science part of this, but I want, I want to avoid that until the second part. I want to get into just the design of this, how you decide on colors and the design that is there, this figure that is there. All right, okay. Well, to start with, something that um, is very important is working with your out my ideas in pencil. Right. And so I work on paper on a tabletop in, with erasers and pencils and just and start sketching. Okay. And so that's where all my ideas begin. And it's very immediate and it's very fast and you can, you know, you have that sort of intuitive response to paper and pencil. Mm -hmm. And once I get something that I like, and usually I work with a shape too, like I love these shapes that are very narrow and long. Mm -hmm. um, they're mm -hmm. interesting to work with. So I'll be doing some of these different little shapes and ideas and then I'll start to uh, work with them in brush and ink. So I'll bring up my inks and I'll work very fast and very large. So these shapes that you see here mm -hmm. are brushwork. They're brushes that I've moved across paper. Okay. And it's India ink and these little X's which are chromosomes. This is of course the double helix, the right. DNA helix. And these are little brush strokes that I kind of just pound out on paper. Mm -hmm. And these little plant forms um, are also part of that sort of brush stroke. So you can see that I've got some things that are sort of loose and sloppy and sort of funky, and some, mm -hmm. some things that are more precise. So that's what you're seeing here with these loose things, again, is brushwork. Then I bring that into the computer as a scanned image, okay. and I have software then that creates that as a vector image. Okay. So it has endpoints, and then I can use my tools to go in and fill with color. So these are shapes that are filled with color. Okay. But this ends up then, and this is really the, the most fun part, as a digital image. So I've taken it out of the tangible realm, and it, then it lives then inside the computer. Okay. So if you talk about um, uh, prints as we will later, but this is also a print, there's really no original anymore. Okay. It's, it's all the digital. It's, yeah. it's a, a program. Yep, there's no, so. one, there's no one true original, or another way to say it is that these are all originals. Well, of course, these scarves are because they're each hand-sewn. Right. And each have a little bit different back. Right. Now, something else you'll see in here is, is type, and I've yes. just used this as a, uh, a font that I've selected right. and used it straight out as type because I love that edgy, sort of, you know, graphically sure. precise look that's next to the loose brushwork that you see here. And embedded in here then is the ATCG, which we're getting to the science, that's mm -hmm. the single nucleotide polymorphisms, okay. that's the code of our DNA. And then I've got some vocabulary in, in here, too, as like messenger RNA and uh, some of the other okay. verbiage, which we love. Okay. Well, the, the influences in, in terms of, of, of this material, and I, I've, I've wondered, you made a transition in life, like many people that become atheists, uh, from, from being religious to, to coming to athe atheism. Could you briefly tell us where you came from and how, how you've arrived at this position? so that it's part of our program here, which is dealing with atheism, too. That's right. Well, I read um, a lot of books to get me interested in science, okay. and I really started reading about three weeks ago. And one of the main books in my um, library is uh, books by Dawkins, okay. because his um, Ancestor's Tale, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Wonderful. is all about genetics and exactly what I've embedded in my art. But his most recent one, with the God Delusion, really was an impact for me. Goodbye. And then you, this group hosted uh, the last conference and he came to town. Right. And so I went to that and I realized that you read all the books I read and you think just the way I think <laughs> and you have this idea of critical thinking, right. um, reason and rationality that I was just hungry for mm -hmm. and knew that's what I had always, you know, irritated me about um, the institution of religions and, okay. you know, specifically the way I was brought up. Sure. So I was, I was ready to, to say, I'm joining up. So it was, it was science for you. Science that, brought that, me to it. That brought you to it. And, it, and it, it is science that is also now influencing in a huge way all of your art. Yes. 
Uh, and in, in particular, in terms of the science, it is evolutionary science. Yes. In, in, the, in a sense, because uh, when you get to the, 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 the DNA code and, and the material that we're going to be talking about, you're really talking about science as evolution, aren't you? It, well, and it's a key idea in science, and, and where I've landed is the life sciences. Okay. And evolution, of course, is the foundation to all of that, is genetics is. Genetics mm -hmm. is in the underpinning. But what really, really got me excited was that in 1987, there was this big, brand new, wonderful world of the digital world that mm -hmm. I just jumped in head first, and I love technology. Mm -hmm. And it was all consuming, and it was, in, it, it was a paradigm shift, really, in a lot mm -hmm. of ways. Mm -hmm. It's a cliche. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when I discovered genetics, it was the same kind of thrill. Okay. And so I'm really very, you know, emotionally passionate about it, uh, too. It, it ha it's the same sort of sense of discovery. Now, th th to me, this is curious because growing up in, in my background is humanities, so I did have some art courses. <laughs> I've had almost no science. Most humanities majors do not have a lot of science. And so when I look at a person who's gone through the art system and has a degree in fine arts, I think, where did she get the science from? Is there, is there something, because you, you mentioned your father's influence, how he was an artist and, and, and that was a great influence. Is there an influence that would have brought you to science during this period of growing up? Well, uh, we always had National Geographic at home, okay, sure. and I was fascinated by human origins. Okay. And the leakies were in Africa. Yes. And they were telling tales. That's, mm -hmm. what, that's what the archaeologists and anthropologists do. Right. And uh, I took note of that and in a good way and also kind of wondering if maybe how accurate are these guys. Sure. Then Desmond Morris came out with a naked ape. Right. Now, isn't that interesting? <laughs> he is a scientist, a zoologist. Yeah. He's also an artist. Yeah. He's a very good artist. Mm -hmm. So, and I was, I was pretty young. I was in seventh or eighth grade then, but I was discovering these things on my own, and it was always part of me. Uh, part of an interest, but it was never really acknowledged in quite the way art was. Sure. So, and then I just kept reading. Um, but again, recently it was like I dove back into it. Okay, so the, the science was was on the edges of your of your of view, uh, peripheral area, and then then as you moved into that that uh, uh, Adobe, Adobe Illustrator, which it, was the software. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now that proved to be a key element in changing your art, you've said. And then the science also comes in at, at about the same time to help change it. In the initial phases, though, of, of using that kind of art, this isn't what you came up with, though, was it? No. Um, in those early years of, of entering technology, though, I think got me ready, probably got me a little bit more ready to really embrace science in the way that I have, too. Because okay. all those things are all kind of linked with the way you think about the world and work with the world. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at the imagery I was doing in the 80s and then later in the 90s for my corporate clients, I was developing my own personal style because that's what they hired me to do as a creative sure. person. Sure. I did primarily illustration work. And what you're hired to do as an illustrator really is the same as, you, as I'm doing now as a fine artist. Mm -hmm. And they liked my colors and they liked my style. And my style for my corporate clients is very similar to what you see here with this okay. sort of flowing line and whimsical kind of feel and okay. joyous color. Well, I'd like to get into some of the other items that you have for art and uh, as, as examples. For example, she has ties. And I'll pick this up here and hold it up for the camera. Uh, some of the, well, the vibrant colors are there the, in, in terms of design. And if, if you are able to look closely, this is an uh, ancient a, a little fossil. A little trilobite. Yes, a little trilobite. Okay. And in the background is ATCG. Mm -hmm. And then you see um, a little rock painting form that's above that little trilobite, sitting in that little black-red area. Okay. And then the rest of the tie has some more of the of DNA references as you... If you would un if you'd unfold it, you don't have to do that. But, oh, okay. but yeah, yeah. Anthropologists love that one. They do. Now, what what about this tie? That this is not for the anthropologist. <laughs> That's for anybody who, who has a, a white shirt and needs a blue tie, and people love blue, and <laughs> so we have to think about practicality. But uh, it's it's um it's not just for men. Women love that tie too. Oh, so some I, women wear ties. I can see where anyone. Mm -hmm. Yes, they're yeah. very very 
the vibrant colors again. Yeah. And, and this is a silk scarf yep. packaged. Yep. How so it would come if you, yep. if you were to purchase it in a package, area. So a lot of what I do, too, gets into the marketing of these products. So okay. the packaging and all of the um, little tags and things that go with it, which, you know, is my design background. As sure. a designer, I love to do that. Mm -hmm. um, Printing those ties is really a hoot. They, you, I print on a really big piece of fabric. It's about 30 or 40 inches wide, and it's a big triangle-looking shape, and it's on a bias. Mm -hmm. Now, you have two sets of cards, or types of cards. And if you'd explain those, because again, the print is, the, the influence of this kind of print is, is definitely seen in the cards, but the cards are for different purposes. So if I look at these cards first, these are simply a card to write. Is that, is that I call it? those no note cards, and there's, note there's cards. a set of six, and they're all different colors and a little bit different pattern. Okay. And the helix and the chromosome, chromosomes are always in there. Okay. And it's, that's a must for a scientist. You must have the chromosomes as well. Okay. I, I learned that. <laughs> yeah. Now, and, and, and these are specific for events that happen in your life. And so if you could point out the different ones. Okay. Well, uh, this is a set of six different cards, and um, they're what they're called all occasion cards. Sure. And I think I will open this up and show okay. that way. They're a little bit noisy here. Um, but this is a really good example of vector art. Okay. And the key about vector art is that you can size that art to any size, you can scale it up and down, and you don't lose resolution. Okay. If you, if just is hold this, that, is that, this that's good? a nice angle right like there. This? Yes, that's okay. perfect. Okay, so here I'm using some other languages just to say thank you. Danka, gracias. And you can see the helix there. And again, some more vocabulary, ATCG, polymorphisms. And happy sequential birthday. <laughs> I would prefer that one. <laughs> okay. It's got a little say, saying here, and it's really small type, so I'm not going to read that tonight. Okay. But. Um, congratulations, bravo, celebrate with a helix floating around in there. And happy birthday. And fossils are embedded in here. Okay. Well, th this has been delightful in terms of looking at the different types of art that Lynn has available and seeing the connection between science and art as it has been developed through her work. Uh, this, this has really been a delight to, for me to go through this tonight and have you participate in, in the understanding of your art and, and how science and how the development of technology has helped you create the art and inspire you to become the entrepreneur that you are. Uh, on, the web, on the screen, you will see the website and uh, the phone number displayed so that you can get in contact with us if you wish. For those of, who, of you who contact us, we'll send you a free newsletter and if you'd like to inform us of topics that you're interested in exploring, we would appreciate that. Thank you for listening, and if you're interested in us, we're interested in you.